Praise God. Do you know who he is? Do you know who he is? He is a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper, and your God. Your God. He is a miracle worker, a promise keeper, a way maker, and he is your God. That is who he is, and that is who we worship. That is why we worship, because he is everything to us. But most importantly, even when you don't see it, he's working. Even when you don't see it, he's working. And then it's when you don't feel it, he's working. We have to keep this in mind. We have to get this into our spirit. We have to absorb this and make this a part of us that he is our God. And even when we don't see it, he's working. Because when things look their worst, we sometimes cry out, oh God, where are you? He's working. And and you, you get down with some ailment or illness and you say oh please Lord help me where are you I need help you don't feel it but he's working we have got to get out of this microwave stage or this microwave mentality and give it over to God because my Bible says that one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is at one day he does not wear a watch and he's not going to operate in your time but in his time in his time all will be well but you just have to believe you have to believe that he is your God your God not somebody take him personally claim him declare ownership over him that's what he's done to you. Declare ownership over him. He is my God. So when you do something or say something against God, you have offended me because that is my God. That is where we have to find ourselves. And that is where we have to settle. That he is our God. And even though we don't see him, he's working. How do we know? Because he is a promise keeper. He's a promise keeper. And he said, I will never leave nor forsake you. So he's there. He's there. Oh, man. We, we, we got to get to where we need to be so that we can be who he wants us to be. And when we are there, then we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. Let's talk today about faith. And having faith is our position in Christ. So that's what we want to talk about today. Our faith. Our position in Christ. And I know you know this already. Or I have no doubt that you know it. But maybe some don't know it. And then maybe some have forgotten. So let's just call this a refresher. Let's just call it a refresher. What I'm talking about is some people wondering, what do I have to do to be acceptable to God? Or, or what do I need to do to get into God's family? Or how can I do something to win God's favor? Well, the answer to all of those is simple, and it is nothing. Nothing. There's nothing you can do. You can't earn it. God accepts all people who have faith in Christ and are believers in his finished work on the cross. He accepts us all. And this goes way back to way back when. If you remember, Abraham was accounted righteous and accepted by God. 
because he had faith. And because of that faith that Abraham had, he set a standard for us today where we find ourselves in a position for whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. Whosoever, anybody. That standard was set way back when because of Abraham's faith in Christ. And now we have the best position of anyone or any nation or any person that you could think of. In Galatians chapter 3 at verse 26, he says, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Are you listening to me? He says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. I hope you're understanding what he said. He is telling that we are all the same in Christ Jesus. We are all the same in Christ Jesus. Verse 26 says, Through faith in Jesus, we are not only blessed as Abraham's son, but also as the sons of God. So, we are his heirs. And being his heirs, we stand to inherit everlasting life. Life forever. By faith in Christ. Verse 27 says, The baptism means we have died to our old lives and been birthed into a new life. It's like putting on new clothes. Christ has covered us. We put on Christ, it says in verse 27. We put on Christ. Christ covers us and gives us a new identity. A new identity. That one is one that ought to make us just shout. You see, because we're no longer sinners now. We have a new identity. We have become saints. Yesterday I was a sinner, and today I'm a saint. I have a new identity. I'm not the same person I was yesterday. Verse 28 says, Everyone, everyone comes to the Father the same way. So we're just one group. We are one group. All are one. Racial, social, and gender distinctions can divide and hinder a person from coming to Christ. We are one body. The body of Christ. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. And watch this. Paul, Paul compares the unity of the church to the body of man. Brilliantly, he shows us how the body of Christ is the same as the body of man. In the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 12, he lays this out, and when you see it, it makes it more personal to you, and you can understand what he's saying here, and it gives us a purpose, and again, it gives us our position in Christ. That's what we're talking about this morning, our position in Christ. Verse 12 of chapter 12, it says, for as the body is and hath many members. And think about it. Your body is just one unit, but it has many members. Head, hands, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, feet, legs, pancreas, stomach, lungs, heart. All of these members that make up this one body. He, he's saying that all of these things make just one body. Neither one of them is separate from the other. They're all one body. It is a complete unit, in other words. 
And all the members of that one body, being many, are just one body. So also is Christ. We're all one body in Christ. And watch how he puts this together. He says, for by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jewish or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Now think of it this way. Think of it this way. Our body has all of these different parts in it, but every one of those parts are nourished by the same blood flow. If you are AB negative, O, A, whatever the rest of those blood types are, every part of your body functions off of that type. It's just one, one unit fed by one source. The Holy Spirit is that blood and we're all fed by that one source. If you take a part of your body off and try to replace it with another part that has a different type, it won't work. It has to be AB negative because that is what the system is ran on. So if you are not operating on the Holy Spirit, then you are not part of Christ's body because that's the only thing that it works on. One body operating on one spirit, on one Nourish me, one blood. And it says, for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not the hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? That's a rhetorical question. It is obvious that it's part of the body. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, am I not part of the body? Well, look, they're there. They're part of the body. They make that unit. And if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I am not part of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? But of course it is. They have to operate in that one unit together on that same nourishment. And here's where he lays it out. It says, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? Where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? You see, what it is saying is that each part of this body has to use the services of the other part to make the function properly. The ear has to pay attention, otherwise the eye won't know that there's somebody behind it because the eye is focused out here. Bodies depend on each other, and this is what Paul Paul has pointed to out. I said it was it's beautiful. It's beautiful the way he lays this out. Tells us that God blessed him. It says, "But now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased Him." God has set each part of that, each member of that body in the place where he wanted it because that's where it works the best for what it does. So the point is being is that do not be upset because you can't play music like Mike. That's not, you have a part too. Mike can't usher like Donna. But we need them both to make the church work. And this is what Paul is saying. Don't get upset when somebody is doing something that you can't do. Do your part well because whatever you do, the whole thing looks good now. But if you over here resisting because you can't do that, now you're dragging the whole thing down. We have to work together. And he says that the body of Christ is as the human body and each part must work together to make the church function. Oh, he's talking about 
the, the unity, the necessity of unity is very important so that the whole body can function in the way that it's designed to work. What would happen if General Motors made a Chevy and didn't put no tires on it? No, you can get in there and turn that baby on and rip the engine up and do everything, but you couldn't go nowhere. It wouldn't function. It has to have everything to work. This is what he said, that we have to be as a unit. And there's many members. There's many members. But we have to coexist because we're operating on that same substance that nourishes each and every part. If, if you take one of the parts away, then the other parts suffer. The other parts suffer. God has given us life freely. But we have to maintain it. And how do we maintain it? We have to maintain it by being attached to the root system. So that we can be nourished. If you remember what Jesus said in John 15, 5. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. As long as we are together, you can produce much fruit. But separate you from me and you can't do nothing. He says that when you separate from him, then the vine, the branch withers up and dies and is thrown into the fire. When we separate ourselves from the, branch, the, the vine, we wither up. But we're producing less fruit. A tree with 12 branches on it will produce 12 volumes of fruit. But you take a couple of those branches away, now your volume is down. You need the whole thing to get the full function of what you're looking for. Paul is telling us here in this verse that we are one together. And what we need to do is make each other look good by doing the best that we can do for and to each other. But when we separate or go against one another, we're making the whole unit suffer. We're making the whole unit suffer. There are many members to that brand. And it is one body. And every part is vital to the function of the body. Every part is vital to the function of the body. See, we, we don't give our pinky toe much credit for anything. But when it's missing, it takes you off balance. You can definitely tell that it says he's not walking right. Something's wrong. But it's just that little pinky toe. The guy that you don't consider or be concerned about anything. When you are part of a body, if you're the pinky toe, when you are missing, the rest of the body knows. The rest of the body knows. Because it's, it's off balance now. It, it doesn't have that, that roll in effect. It gets to that point and then it, it, it drops off. We have to pull together. If we have to pull together. If the eye says, because I'm not an ear, am I not part of the body? Well, because I can't be the ear, I can't hear. I'm just going to shut down and do nothing. Now, what does that leave the rest of the body? Stumbling around in the darkness, I would say. Because the eye quit. Are you your brother's keeper? Are you your brother's keeper? I'll go with what Moses said in um, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 30. Moses says, I presented to you this day death and life, blessings and cursing. 
You choose life so that you and your kids or your children may live. He is saying here that you have these options, but you choose. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to say you choose life so that you can live. But if you choose death or if you choose curses, then you're not going to. So you choose, but you have the choice. You get to choose everything that we find ourselves in. We have to make a decision. Now, do we choose life or do we choose death? And if we choose life, then we choose to be connected to the vine. I choose Jesus this morning. I think it was Joshua said, uh, you choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua says that in um, Joshua 24. The book of Joshua, chapter 24. I believe it's verse 15. I won't I'll swear to it. But that's what he says. You have an option. You can choose to live the way your forefathers lived. You can choose to live the way the, the what do they call them, the, the uh, parrot, not the parrot, uh, the, the heathen, I'll just call them heathen. You can choose to live the way the heathens live today, or you can choose Christ. But we have that choice, and that choice came with Jesus' work on the cross. That finished work on the cross gave us everything we need. It gave us that spirit so that we could repent and be changed. It gave us that opportunity to repent and change so that we could receive that new identity. We were born in sin. Oh, well, wait a minute. Little babies ain't never done it. No. But they have a sinful nature. It just comes with them. You don't have to teach your baby how to lie. Just ask one. Two-year-old in the, in the back room doing something he ain't got no business. Ask him what he's doing. See what he did. Nothing. He's doing nothing. Done towed the whole place up. But he, you didn't have to teach him that. But we have to train him how to make the right decisions and come to Christ and say, Father, I have sinned. Forgive me of my sin and come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. That's what we have to teach him. And then his identity can change from a sinner to a saint. And that's what we're faced with this morning. Have we made that decision? Have we sought the opportunity to make that decision? Or are we still wondering, what does it take to be accepted by God? How can I get into God's bed? And what must I do to win favor with Christ? The answer is simple. Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing you can do. It is a free gift of God. Ours is to relax and receive the gift. Now that is the hard part because it's so simple. Oh, wait a minute. Now it's got to be more than that. But no. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is life eternal. That's what we're faced with this morning. The ability to relax and receive the gift of God. And when we relax and receive the gift of God, then our identity will change and our lives will change. And then we can change the lives of others. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Teaching them what I have taught you. The miracle of rebirth. The miracle of rebirth. 
Nicodemus asked how it could be done. Can an old man enter into his mother's womb again and be born? No. Change your heart. Receive Christ. And live. Amen. Amen. Change your heart and live. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you give us an avenue that we can travel down and find ways to the kingdom. Father, you said in your word that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Help us, Father, to find that way. Help us to seek you in all that we do. Guide us in the way that we should go and help us to be the best that we can be. But, Father, most of all, help us to share what we have with those who don't know you. We've seen the light, Father, so help us show them the light. Guide us in the way that we should go and introduce us to the people that we should meet. Bless us, Father, with the calmness, with the assurance that we can speak your word with confidence and win the hearts of those who are lost. We ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would bless and keep us, that you'd go before us and behind us and keep our feet on that narrow path of righteousness, guiding us in the way that we should go, helping us to be the best that we can be. And, Father, we thank you for what you've done in our life. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. And we thank you for what is yet to come. And we ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, to be with us through it all. When we don't see you, Father, when we don't feel you, help us to know that you are there. In the matchless name of Jesus, amen.